Got it. I always have to fix it anyway. It doesn't. It doesn't ever line up. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh no, it doesn't. Never has. <laughs> no. Ever. So I don't even know why I do the, the countdown. <laughs> but um, I hope today's topic isn't too uh, triggering, because um, it's it's sort of what this story hinges around is a. Um, they never use the word pandemic, but Ooh. it's you know it's a. You know, it's, it's a, a plague. It's a, a, dis- a plague, yeah. <laughs> so I hope, uh, you know, I know we're on our way out of this thing, it seems like, but uh, still, I think we all have a lot of trauma. So, um, anyways. Trigger warning. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll have to put in a sound effect there. Um, but, uh, anyways, welcome to the show. This is Turn One Soul Ring. I'm Kevin. I'm Riley. And I'm Ainsley. And uh, today on the show, we are. Starting a new series by explaining the events depicted in the Magic the Gathering novel, The Thran, which was written by J. Robert King and originally published in December 1999. And uh, Ainsley suggested we do a little bit of a uh, where are they now with our our writers here. Um, And so right up top, um, uh, he's actually written several other MTG novels, including a couple we've covered on the show. Oh, uh, interesting. Time Streams, oh, one of my favorites. which was a goodie, yeah. yeah. That was a good one. Okay. Um, I was unable to find his exact age, and actually at one point I thought he had died because it was like J. Robert King obituary, but then when you clicked on it, it was Robert J. King. So oh. different guy. Uh, but... Um, just and, jaking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or if you type in J. Robert, you get Oppenheimer, right? So you got you, you to do the king. Um, but um, he, um, he, he, had, he had had a, a career leading up to writing MTG novels, wrote a bunch of uh, D&D novels, hmm. um, and he's been writing fantasy books um, ever since 99, and it sounds like he's been quite, su- quite successful doing it. So. Good for him. Hey. Yeah. He has Absolutely. a niche, clearly. Absolutely, yeah. And a beard. If anybody uh, wants to look up a picture of him. Not a great beard, but <laughs> it's, it's a beard. Got a niche and a beard. What more do you need? <laughs> so, The Thran is a standalone novel and is a prequel to the Weatherlight Saga, as well as the Artifact Cycle, uh, which we've covered on the show previously. And uh, it takes place mostly on Dominaria, 5,000 years before the events of the Brothers' War. Mm. Uh, and I think we like briefly sort of touched on Yogmoth's origins back when maybe we covered Planeswalker, but of course this will be a much more um, in-depth look at the character. That's fun. Yeah. So it tells the story of how the Thran Empire fell and how it was caused by internal struggles engineered by a lowly eugenicist who would grow to become Dominaria's most dangerous enemy, Yogmoth. Ooh, struggle is real. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that's why we wanted to cover this before we moved on to the invasion cycle where Phyrexia and Yogmoth are once again front and center as the antagonists of the story. Uh, so before we go headlong into Yogmoth's Phyrexian invasion of Dominaria, let's find out how the Thran physician became the god of an entire plane. Oh, that's fun. Okay, mm. I'm super psyched about this. Yeah. And he's good looking. He's too, so bit of a hottie for also, all you also they they do mention queers out there that he's he's taller than most thran too and you know there's a lot of pressure on men to be tall there's a lot of pressure there's on a men lot of there shouldn't tall. be no but there is and, and riley you and i need to break that down as tall men <laughs> we need to be advocates for the short <laughs> for the short <laughs> yeah bring him up like, to our level and like normalize, you know, short men or like men dating women that are taller than them. Yeah. Also f- great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Short like, kings. That's know? right. Short kings. Uh, someone used, I used to work with would call me a short king, um, ironically. <laughs> and it was, it was, it was funny. It was that, a good bit. That's a fun bit. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, Yagmoth was born during the final century of the Thran Empire, during a time of political conflict between the elite imperialists and republicans. And the imperialists were, you know, basically like liberals. Um, uh, And it was uh, basically a war between artificers and scientists. Little is known about his childhood, but due to his fascination with the human body and his view that it was a, quote, marvelous machine, he became a eugenicist on the republican side. So he's Dr. Yagma. And just look at him. Oh yeah. And interestingly, like on the artwork for uh, I'm sure many listeners know this, but on the artwork uh from his uh card in 
Modern Horizons uh, 1, his belt buckle is actually the insignia for Phyrexia, which is fun. Very oh, fun. Yeah. Yeah. And let, me, let me paint fun a little, little picture egg. for you here, too. He's, he's got nice, long, dark hair, an eyeliner. His nails are painted black, and he's surrounded by crystals. Yeah, so power, like power stones <laughs> yeah. here for it oh yeah oh yeah um i also like his like chest plate thing that looks like a, a, a rib, rib cage. cage it's it's very very cool it's very gothy it's all just mm-hmm. very gothy witchy yeah. and excellent he's a he's a tough character to hate and we're gonna we're gonna find that as as we as we explain the story i love a complicated yeah. villain mm-hmm. oh i love it yeah Just as a small refresh, eugenics is the practice of improving the human species by selectively mating people with specific desirable traits, and it aims to reduce human suffering by, quote, breeding out disease, disabilities, and so-called undesirable characteristics from the population. Yeah, it's, quote, improving. (laughs) Right. And needless to say, it's frowned upon, Um, or at least it is in, in the modern world. You know, this was something that the Nazis tried to do, so... Generally, if the Nazis were here for it, it's bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's good. And unlike Yogmoth Daddy, Yahtzees are not Yahtzees. <laughs> Yahtzees. <laughs> <laughs> Those are his followers, the Yahtzees. <laughs> Nazis are not sexy. <laughs> no, most of them weren't. No. Uh, so, unfortunately for Yogmoth, the Republicans lost the power struggle, and all their followers, including the eugenicists, were exiled, which occurred when Yogmoth was 30. His exile lasted five years, and during that time, he traveled the globe, visiting many civilizations in his ruthless, cold-hearted pursuit of knowledge. And here I'm getting, like, Voldemort vibes, right? He Mm -hmm. leaves Hogwarts, and then it's like, what happened to him? And, you know, Dumbledore's got to, like, figure it out. Very cool. Yeah. I really wish the sixth movie would have been better. Mm. Such a shame. Yeah. A lot of things with that series. (laughs) Such a shame. Um, Interesting that it's called Globe, because, like... Is it like a... Yeah, so the planes are actually like essentially planets and then the blind eternities are the space in between them. But I don't know if it's the same way that uh, the space in between our planets in our reality are... You can travel to them in some kind of vessel. Because if if any of us were to go out into space unprotected, we would die pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. So I'm not exactly don't know sure. That. Yeah, I'm I'm not exactly sure <laughs> how that works, or maybe your spark would ignite. Who knows? Uh, so I I yeah, really don't exactly. know how it works, but um, they they do they do describe planes as as planets. They well they don't describe them that way, but that's how you can like you think can picture of them. it in your yeah, mind's they, eye. Yeah, like they are round. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a flat earther, so uh, I'm gonna picture them as square. Well, with flat Earth, there's only the Earth is flat. The other planets are round. Oh, yeah. So they no, they. It's... Oh boy. Yeah, it's called flat Earth, not flat planets. What are you doing, dumbass? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in his cold-hearted pursuit of knowledge, he committed many atrocities, um, which the following are known. He set the black cough upon the dwarves of the Oren Deeps inciting a workers' rebellion that nearly killed the Dwarven King and ended a thousand years of Dwarven rule. Oof, the black cough. Doesn't sound good. No. No. He turned the creeping mold of Argoth into a virulent plague that ate away the Argothian elves. He also kidnapped their leader, Priest, and her healers, ordering the elves to pay ransom for them and the cure she had developed for the plague. When the elves paid, he delivered to them only sweetened water and 12 dead healers. Neat. He set the White Death upon the Minotaurs of Talrum just to study its effects. He infected the leaders of the Cat People nations with rabies, after which they tore each other to pieces. You think they'd have some kind of um, vaccine for it, but anyway. Um, he poisoned the human tribes of Galado Mesha, and he pithed and vivisected the bay of the Shivan Vyashino. What's pithed? Um, it's like putting a needle into a brain. Okay. And like vivisecting is also opening up the cranium and messing around with the brain. I see. Yeah. Well, up until That's that point. The... Sorry, go ahead, Rouse. 
Oh, I was going to say that's quite the Tinder profile. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding, right? <laughs> With that picture? With that picture? Ooh. Oh, yeah. They're going to be I mean, you'd, right. you'd swipe, but then you look at the profile and you're like, e. Um, yeah. It's, ooh, it's a little problematic. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting, like, up until, like, that sort of that last point there, but um, that it's all, like, like, slow death stuff. Like, mm-hmm. he, you know, sets something into motion that will you know kill or wipe out these species yeah just to study what the what the disease does Hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and also besides the human tribes they're all um non-humans which yagmoth you know because of who he is thinks they are they have less value than human sentience Mm. so 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 do you think he was doing it like just for the sheer fact of like doing field research or was this something that you know he had a grudge against these populations no i do i do think it was just to um see what would happen to like to further his knowledge of of science um he does he doesn't he doesn't really get like vengeful until later into the story but that's definitely there like right under the surface like Mm -hmm. i think he is he you likes know. the dark arts of science. Yeah. Like yeah. no like no matter what, he was like I said, little is known about his childhood, but I think no matter what, he was gonna be He was bad not hugged news. enough. Yeah. No, they should have put him in a concrete square, like immediately. <laughs> so little else is known about his time abroad, but after five years he was suddenly called back to Halcyon, the Thran capital, where the people remained unaware of his inhumane actions. He was recalled to deal with a high profile medical emergency. Glaceon, the chief artificer and technological genius of the Thran Empire, had been attacked and stabbed with a power stone. As a result, he'd contracted a mysterious disease that was impervious to Thran healing magic. With nowhere to turn for help, Glaceon's wife, Rebek, used her influence as the city's chief architect to bring Yogmoth back to the capital. And a little about the Thran Empire, Halcyon and her sister cities were more advanced than any civilization that followed on Dominaria, and it was all powered by power stones. Uh, power stones made by various mana rigs, and we've mentioned the mana rig in this series before, um, and during this time period, the Thran facilities were in their heyday. There was, of course, the rig located in Shiv, but there was a smaller one in Halcyon. And that was where Glacian spent most of his days, and it was on the rig that he was attacked. Mm. Living on a rig. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that's him. He's got the <laughs> oh, yeah. signature He's got white. a silver fox yeah. going. Yeah. That's a good look. Yeah. Yeah, he looks good. Yeah. Not anymore, though. Oh, spoiler alert. Uh, like all great civilizations, there was those at the top and those at the bottom, and just as Glacian toiled in the rig each day, the citizens at the very bottom of Thran society lived beneath the rig in what was known as the Caves of the Damned. Oh. Uh, they were referred to as the Untouchables, but in truth, they were just another group of exiles. The caves had begun as a penal colony, where the city shipped its incorrigibles, much the same way the British Empire once sent theirs down under. You come from a land down under. Yeah. Is that what you were hoping I was going to do? Uh, I, <laughs> I was thinking that. Yeah. He was giving me a little side eye, like, as though, it's like, okay, this is your cue. It's like, yeah, come on. Sing it. Setting this up. So back then, it was mostly thieves and murderers that became mushroom farmers and fishermen who caught blind fish, not to mention obsidian carvers. And talk about the benefit of private prisons, mm. right? Needless to say, it was necessary to learn communal cooperation or die, but they learned too well, and eventually banded together and overthrew their facilitators, then took over the caves. Cool. Good for them. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Every attempt Halcyon made to force a surrender was met with dead negotiators. So, war was declared, and the Halcyte Guard marched down to retake the caves, but the damned fought viciously in their own element, and the capital relented. The result was a sealing off of every entry save for one where the city posted guards to prevent upward incursions. <laughs> Stay down there. Also, that's how you could refer to like throwing up. I'm having an upward incursion. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so although the city had lost control of its penal colony, <laughs> it had... You know, if you're throwing up, I think people know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> 
So although the city had lost control of its penal colony, it hadn't lost a repository for its human refuse because every day a parade of chained prisoners was marched into the caves and who knew what happened to them after that. I guess they didn't get parole either. It's like once you're down, you're down. But they weren't content they weren't content to stay down there. The untouchables regularly struck at Thran society with attacks like the one they perpetrated on Glaceon and the Manor Rig, and they were led by a familiar character. Long before he was Phyrexian, Gix was the leader of the Untouchables. He was also the one that stabbed Glaceon with a power stone, which had broken off inside of him. Glaceon, not Gix. Um, <laughs> right after he stabbed him, but before he disappeared, he said, Welcome to the Company of the Damned. Nice, good Gix voice. Glaceon was taken to an infirmary where the power stone was removed. It was then taken to a different part of the building where it became unstable and caused a lethal explosion. And a, anyway, a year passed, and by that time, Rebek had successfully petitioned to bring Yagmoth out of exile. When he arrived in Halcyon, he was greeted by her. He'd stopped at the gates to the city. A narrow waterway also surrounded the city, narrow enough to walk through. It ensured that those entering Halcyon would have clean feet and those leaving would have theirs immediately caked with sand and dirt as they strode into the open desert. She explained the purpose of the stream to Yagmoth and beckoned him to step in. Come here. I couldn't get an aerial escort, but at least I can wash the feet that brought you here. Wink. And wash his feet she did, removing everything down to his skin and nails. Oof. I bet she, like, bit his, like, long desert nails off, too. Gross. Like, to, to uh, sharpen uh, them. Uh. Or not sharpen them, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I bet. I bet they just smell terrible. <laughs> you, you're gonna make me have an upward incursion. <laughs> <laughs> so when his feet were clean, Rebecca had to help keep his balance on the smooth marble floor that followed. The two walked arm in arm to a sedan chair, flirting the whole time. Mm. She was taller than most Thran men, so or he he was rather. <laughs> Hashtag short kings. The sedan chair was essentially a flying armchair or a pair of armchairs in the case of the one Rebecca and Yogmoth took to the Halcyon Infirmary. Uh, they were a common sight in any of the Thran city-states. Um, so anyway, like we mentioned earlier, a year had passed since the stabbing, and by that point, Glaceon was bedridden due to some kind of wasting disease that no Thran healer could determine the cause of. And he was not happy to see Yogmoth. Glaceon thought all things could be solved with artifice and magic, so he didn't put much stock into medicine. He also didn't like Yogmoth, probably because he was a good judge of character, and Yogmoth was a piece of shit, as we've already outlined. Um, not to mention how friendly his wife was with the eugenicist. Like my husband's all sickly, and I'm lonely. <laughs> probably. Let me yeah. touch your bicep. Well, it is a wasting disease, so he's probably not getting too hard these days. No. Yeah. yeah. No Oof. upward. No upward incursions. No. <sighs> <It's a> shame. <laughs> I guess you could also say that if 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 she's on top, it's an upward incursion. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what they're gonna rename the sex position. <laughs> I don't know. It's gonna be it's gonna be tough to knock cowgirl yeah. off its pedestal. No pun intended. <laughs> So after a quick introduction, Yogmoth removed his travel cloak, laid out the contents of his bag, and washed his hands, but not his feet, because they were already clean. He washed his hands up to his elbows in preparation for inspecting the artificer. While he did that, Glacian gave him the rundown of their current situation. Is this my line here? Yes, sir. Yeah, you have to understand. You have to understand. I was just I was just wondering what this picture was about. Oh, so <laughs> I, I I wanted to put this here so you guys would like it's a it's a sedan chair, but it's like a really old one because there isn't a picture oh, okay. of sedan chairs in like the <laughs> the MTG you know picture uh, yeah. catalog. So it's in like MTG lore. Yeah. It's like imagine this, but it's flying around the city. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. You have to understand. You are no savior, Yogmoth. We are done with real healers. They have exhausted the techniques, and now, in desperation, we turn to you. We aren't setting aside witchery. We are summoning it. Glaceon fixed the large man with a level stare. Your so-called methods are only too well known to us. I was among the elders who voted for your initial banishment. If it were up to me, you would still be stuck in far Jamora. Jamura. 
Jamura. You would still be stuck in Far Jamura, poking sticks up the backsides of syphilitic mules. But my wife fears for me, and the council and city are terrified to do without me, as I am the only one who truly understands the machinery beneath this city. They are willing to try anything, and you, Yogmoth, you just barely qualify as anything. Shots oh, fired. Who's that? Ooh. 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 It's like guy that's, in the that's chair. Not a way huh? to ask for help. No kidding. No <laughs> kidding. So and as then he, he just bangs his wife. <laughs> yeah, it's like get out of your chair, buddy. Try and stop me. Uh, he probably likes to watch though. So as Yogmoth examined Glacian, he explained that he'd heard rumors of a similar ailment affecting the poorer populations of other Thran city states, as well as those of the caves of the damned. Glacian's body was covered in lesions that had grown worse since the attack, and after Yogmoth inspected all of them, he cut a few off for later inspection, uh, without um, anesthetic, by the way. Hmm. Uh, and he explained uh, no one was to have any further skin-to-skin contact with Glacian until he knew how the disease spread. Then he requested quarters to bath, rest, and study the samples taken from Glacian. Just before he left, though, Glacian said, I'll say this for your methods. You understand how to inflict pain. Months passed, and in that time, Yogmoth had deduced that not only did the wound caused by the Power Stone exacerbate Glacian's condition, it was caused by exposure to power stone radiation. That's right, everybody. They cause mm. radiation. Surprise, oh. surprise. He'd confirmed this by removing the power stone from the artificer's wheelchair, bed, and any other powered machine in his room. After that, Glacian's symptoms improved, but he was not yet healed. Still a guy in a chair. Yagmoth had also come up with a name for Glacian's aff- affliction, Thysis which was an old Thran word meaning continual degradation. And like we mentioned earlier, there were rumors of citizens suffering from Thysis in other Thran cities as well as the Caves of the Dam. Damned? Damn. Beneath Halcyon's (laughs) manor rig. (laughs) Damn. (laughs) Having learned everything he could from Glacian, Yogmoth decided to venture into the caves to research the disease further. He'd surmised that Glacian had been infected by the man that had stabbed him, and if he could find the man, he could determine how the disease was spread. And that was a man. (laughs) So he suited up his travel ropes, which, uh, as tattered as they were, were protection against daggers in the back, because they were lined with metal plates and ring mail, which I guess is like chain mail. The book said ring mail. Anyways, um... He had spent five years living among minotaurs and lizard men, so he knew how to protect himself. Mm. Also, you know, they probably weren't too happy with him, so... Anyways. So, on top of that, he pocketed a set of scalpels and three power stone lanterns. He wrapped a couple lengths of rope around his torso, and then came the weapons. Power stone lanterns. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's good. That's a terrible song, but that could improve it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, (laughs) about his waist, he strapped a wide belt with daggers, darts, and a pair of swords, all dipped in poison. He likes poison. (sighs) Who doesn't? Yeah, it would be my choice. Yeah. Then he made his way to the cave's entrance and tied one of his ropes to an outcropping of rock and the other end to himself before one of the guards said, There's nothing we can do for you once you descend. There was never anything you could do for me. Nice. He's so cool. Yeah, oh he goodness. is. He's like such a like emo boy wannabe. <laughs> it's like get out, get out of my way. All right, I got this. There's never anything you could do for me. And with that, he jumped into the hole and descended. The first rope lasted a thousand feet, and the second another five hundred before he was forced to make a final jump from thirty feet up. And, I, and he was just like fine, like three stories, fine, no problem. I, I got my knees are fine. You were new to the darkness. I was born in it. Yes. Why should you just So when he encountered his first group of untouchables, they tried to kill him, but they were killed instead. Uh, not only was Yogmoth a talented doctor, he was also a capable fighter. Eventually, he came upon some untouchables who told him where to find Gix. Then a boy led Yogmoth to the quarantine cave where most of the ill dwelt. The boy explained that 
Whenever someone felt sick, they were taken to the cave so so the disease wouldn't spread. Hey, that's what we do, right? Send them to the hospital. Just get them all together. Just keep them together. What he found was a near skeleton man, baby. God. (laughs) (laughs) So the book doesn't go into any detail, but somehow Yawgmoth either convinced Gix to accompany him back to the city, or he just carried him because after his uh, trip to the caves, he brought Gix back to the infirmary where Glacian lived. And over the following few months, he experimented on the two Thysis-stricken men, although he had still not shared any of his findings with anyone. Hmm. As he worked on them, Gix's Gix's condition improved greatly, while Glacian stayed the same. uh, Rebecca spent those months designing and overseeing the construction of the Thran Temple, a marvel of architecture that would one day float above Halcyon. And that day had arrived. So the foundation of the temple was being launched, and Yawgmoth planned to be there to support Rebek. And as he often did when he left his patients for long bouts, he sedated them into sleep. Because that's what you do, right? (laughs) As a doctor, I gotta go go to the bathroom. So I'm gonna just sedate you (laughs) and. um... Oh, why? Nice. That's good, Rob. (laughs) So by that point, Glacian was wise to Yagmoth's attempts to steal his wife and planned to be the one supporting her when the temple's foundation was launched. So when Yagmoth presented the sedative to him, he only feigned drinking it, like, oh, you know how you do, and instead poured it between his legs to soak into his wheelchair's cushion. Oh, I hate that, like sitting on wet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God, it's the worst. I would have just drank it. <laughs> Yeah, and well, and well, he might be like, I can't feel my legs, like at the end of the, the X-Men first class. <laughs> it's just James McAvoy saying, I can't feel my legs, and then it goes like goes black, and he can get credits. <laughs> it's too long. It's, I, th- I think it was like 30 seconds of him saying, I can't feel my legs. It was, it's a mistake. Uh, anyway, so so then he presented, uh, so then Yawgmoth, or Glacian, pretended to be asleep when Yawgmoth checked on him and Gix moments later. After Yagmoth headed for the ceremony, Glacian wheeled his way to the street and found someone to take him to Rebecca. It's like if you'd left the power stone in his chair, you wouldn't have to ask anybody for help. You could just wheel around. Hmm. Anyways, the ceremony went off without a hitch, and Rebecca was hailed as the genius designer she was. After the Temple Foundation launched and she made a speech, Yagmoth rode his sedan chair to her platform, and they embraced, the physician congratulating the architect. Glacian watched all this from the ground below and couldn't bear to watch his wife in that bastard's arms. Those are his words. Mm -hmm. But Yawgmoth also had news of Glacian's condition for Rebecca, and he convinced her to accompany him back to Glacian and Gix's room to share it. When they arrived, they found the diseased men in a bitter argument. Um... They were just you know, arguing, you know, the upper class putting down the lower class and the lower class threatening to, to destroy the upper class as society. And Yagmoth interrupted the argument. I found the cause of the illness. It could well mean the death of all of us in Halcyon. Is it Halcyon? Yeah, like the drug. Halcyon? Yeah, yeah. Makes, right. you, makes you sleepy. It could well... Oh, okay. <laughs> it could well mean the death of all of us in Halcyon. And the caves below. Well, out with it. We're dying anyway. Power stones in great concentrations. Their energies are toxic. Rebecca and Glacion were shocked at, and at a loss for words while Yagmoth fished a power stone about the size of a human heart from his pocket and held it in his open palm. A single stone gives very little danger, but in combination, in devices such as the sedan chair and whispered doorways, in the very homes and streets of Halcyon, they produce cross currents that disrupt the fabric of growing things. This is the origin of phthisis. Phthisis? Phthisis? Thysis. The P- just forget about the Thys- PH. Yeah, just thysis. All right. Yeah. Thysis. Yeah. All right. You got it. This is the origin of thysis. Your flesh degenerates because it does not regenerate. The influence of power stones prevents natural healing, even the provision of tissues with life-sustaining nutrients. That's impossible. Why isn't your hand withering, then? Every creature has a resistance to these effects, just as every creature has a resistance to other diseases. Some might even be immune. 
Ooh. Yeah, that's a good that's a good way to get around it. <laughs> Say some people are immune. That's when Gix chimed in, telling them all they were doomed while Glacian violently railed against everything Yogmoth was saying. He made some pretty good points, too. Simply the fact that the Thran had lived among power stones for thousands of years with little ill effect. But Yogmoth explained that more Thran were falling victim to Thysis because millennia of power stone radiation had finally worn down their collective flesh. He went on to say that Thysis was contagious, spreading by physical touch, which is why so many in the caves were affected by it. Glacian continued to shout obscenities at Yogmoth, telling those gathered that he was a liar and should be exiled once more. Tiring of the whole thing, Yogmoth strode to a drawer, drew a scalpel, and slashed down at Gix, who was strapped to his bed. Yogmoth cut through the straps, holding his right arm and leg. A second slash cut through the man's bedclothes, revealing a pale chest marked with lesions. He placed the power stone on Gix's chest and held it there while they all watched his flesh degenerate and the man writhed in agony. Stop, Yogmoth! He obeyed, removed his hand, and Rebek grabbed the stone off Gix's chest, but not before Yogmoth grabbed her wrist. Is it a lie? Is it? Maybe you are our only hope. Maybe you'll find the cure. But don't forget the people you're finding the cure for. Oh, she probably likes it. Hmm, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> he let her go and strode out of the room. After he left, Rebecca did her best to reassure her husband, and he did his best to convince her that Yogmoth was a lying monster and Gix was a faker <laughs> and a killer. But she couldn't hear him. She was incapable of seeing the darkness of humanity. Plus, he's so sexy. Yeah. <laughs> she left shortly thereafter, the rift between them even greater. Unfortunately, what Yogmoth and Rebecca forgot to do was strap down Gix after the demonstration, and moments later, he was on top of Glacian, strangling him. Hot. Yeah. Gla <laughs> <laughs> no, they're probably not into it like that. <laughs> Glacian was too weak to fight back, but he did eventually get Gix to relent, and the young man escaped, threatening that he would come back to kill Glacian if he raised the alarm. Mm. And he was successful in making it back to the caves below Halcyon, but the next time we'll see him, he'll be making good on his promises to Glacian. The ones about untouchables destroying Halcyte society. Months passed, and that's a that's a phrase I'm going to be saying a lot because this story takes place over a decade. Blah, so. blah, 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 months blah, blah, blah. passed. Few months later. <laughs> exactly. And by that point, Yogmoth and Rebek had successfully positioned the Elder Council, petitioned the Elder Council to hear their case. They met them in the octagonal council chamber. The council was made up of elders from the eight Thran city-states, the largest, Halcyon and Nyoron had 50 elders, while the others had fewer. Uh, each group occupied one of the chamber's corners behind a podium where the eldest of each city stood. Yeah, that's not a great system either. No, Just like I'm the oldest. It's like I, it's like I got the most seniority. It's like, ah, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> So they were also joined by 20 of Halcyon's best and brightest, leaders, heads of clans, seers, and geniuses. I'd love to be a seer. Mm -hmm. Glacian would have been among that, the, that group were it not for his thysis, although he and his disease were the topic of the day. The council claimed they weren't worried about Thysis, but Yogmoth explained that over the past months, he traveled to most of the other Thran city-states and discovered the disease spreading in those jurisdictions. If the council wouldn't believe him, Yogmoth asked them to let him prove it. He asked, he asked the council to supply him with more funding, healers, equipment, facilities, and the right to screen citizens. That's when one of the council members spoke up. Jameth was his name, and he was the eldest among them. He explained he had a letter written by Glacian for, for the council to hear, so he read it, and he read it good. And I'll, I'm going to read this. Okay. Friends, from my sickbed, dare I call it my deathbed, I write this urgent request and warning. Shun the man Yogmoth. He was once rightly declared an enemy of the state and exiled as such. I plead that he be exiled once more. I have been under his scalpel and his supposed ministrations for too long, have endured excruciating programs, and have watched my body decay rapidly from Yogmoth more than from Thysis. 
He is a charlatan at best, and at worst a monster. I did not wish for his return, nor do I condone that he remain among us. Unless he is exiled, I am confident he will bring us again to civil war. If he is, as my wife supposes, my only hope, then I am consigned to die. I would rather die than live any longer as a prisoner to his violent manipulations. Therefore, I propose that the council vote immediately to banish the man Yogmoth, declaring him now and forever an enemy of the Thran Empire. Glacian of Halcyon. And of course, they don't have last names. Hugs and kisses. Yeah. <laughs> XOXO. XOXO. <laughs> <laughs> winky face, winky face. So, after Jameth finished, many shouts came from the elders, seconding Glacian's words. The moderator explained that they would not vote on Yogmoth's public health proposal until they decided whether or not he should be exiled. So, Yogmoth suggested they combine the two. If he wasn't granted funding and facilities, he would leave the city. Uh, which kind of makes sense. If, he wasn't going, if they weren't going to let him do his work, why would he stay? He could be out there committing atrocities. <laughs> So they voted, and as they did, Yogmoth studied the crowd to see who chose banishment, every, fra- every face imprinted in the back of his mind. And in the end, it was quite close, but Yogmoth was granted everything he'd asked for in his proposal, as well as a continued stay in Halcyon. Mm. And so, like, like Riley, uh, we were talking at the, at the top of the show, and you asked, like, you know, is he just doing this to further his, his knowledge, or, or is he, like, vengeful? And, like, you know, like, right here, he's like, okay, this guy's against me, this guy's against mm-hmm. me, these guys <laughs> got it, these guys got to go, I'm going to get them. Yeah. So he's, he's like, receipts. he's got a list. <laughs> he's got a little notebook that he pulls out, and he's like, okay, this guy, yeah, like, he's, yeah, he's bad news. And then is he also implying that he's probably like immune to thysis? Like is, cause he's obviously not catching it. Yeah, that's, the, yeah, that is the implication that he's immune, that Rebecca's immune, mm. you know, she's working around. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So he was given his own infirmary wing, 24 observers almost unlimited funding, and the right to screen citizens for Thysis. He had, he had also informed the pub- public to contact his branch of public health if they suspected anyone they knew of suffering from Thysis. This is all, like, very surreal, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. going, going through this, and it's like, I'm gonna, it's like, oh, are you coughing? I'm going to call public health. You know, it's like, it's very... Um, You're having people over at your house? I'm going to call and so you get tickets. Yeah, it's very... Um, it's a little too real. <laughs> yeah, it's very... It just makes me squirm a little bit. I know, bit. me too. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, speaking of the caves, by that point in the story, Gix had recovered from Yagamoth's torture and had shared with his people the true cause of their disease. And they would have followed their leader anywhere, but with the knowledge that Thysis was caused by the Halcytes, now more than ever, they fervently wanted to take revenge on them. They use the word fervently a lot in these books. I know we've joked about it before, but like, he's fervent. Sometimes you're fervent. And Gix is a fervent guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he led hundreds of his people, diseased or not, up to the streets of Halcyon to cause as much havoc as possible. And also like... It's like with when Yogmoth made his descent, like it's hundreds of feet down. So these people are like climbing up these like steep cliff faces in pitch black. It's fair. It's like, I, you know, it's commendable. What they do is not commendable, though. So it's just they a, were born in the darkness. That's I'm right. Born yeah. in it. We're going to have to put I was going to say <laughs> Spider-Man 3, but you know what? I'm saying Batman 3 tonight. Excellent. <laughs> we watched Spider-Man 3 on uh, on New Year's Eve. We were hanging out at my parents' house. And Ainsley was just yeah. like, this is terrible. And and my brother and I were like, this is awesome. It's so I know. Bad. I, I, I want to rewatch it. <laughs> it's I haven't a lot. convinced Kyra to rewatch it yet. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of fun. It's If you it's go fun. into it, if you go into it like this is going to be, you know, we can't take this seriously. It, it, it is a lot oh, of fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I think that's the mistake. I mean, that's that's why it was so disappointing in theaters, right? It's like absolutely, yeah. Y- you were legitimately expecting, you know, like after one and two, it's like, how can they fuck this one up? Well, that's it, because you <laughs> could take one and two seriously. Yeah. They were still fun, yeah. But like, but oh, they yeah. were, they're good. They've they're they're good movies. Um, yeah, and they that's 
that's sort of the interesting thing with like the X-Men movies because I feel like they were coming out around the same time and like X1 and X2 are solid movies. They don't have that like kind of uh, fun side that like Sam Raimi movies have. Uh, but mm-hmm. but so with with X three that was just as much of a disappointment, but it hasn't had the it hasn't aged well because there's nothing fun about it because they took that movie seriously, and the filmmakers yeah. on Spider Man three didn't, and so if you don't, it is a lot of fun. Yeah. <clears throat> so, anyways, uh, the Untouchables as they reached the surface and poured out of a sewer grate, they grabbed anything they could find to use as weapons. Then they separated into groups of a couple dozen and moved through the streets, killing anyone they encountered. And this part in the book is just like gruesome, and I, I didn't include any detail here. Thank you. Because um, it's just like this whole novel is is quite uh, quite gruesome. I'm not sure the the age range this is for, but. Uh, even at even at my age, I feel like it's a bit much. <laughs> Thirty plus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe like what is it like uh, like eighteen to thirty five? Like whatever the next one is, like that's for them. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, so by that point, Yogmoth and his observers thought they'd stumbled upon a treatment for Thysis. One of Yogmoth's assistants, Zod, had proposed that certain metals had a blocking effect on magic, so he ordered those assembled to empty their pockets of coins. Then he gathered them up, put them in a smelter, and melted them down. Once melted, Yogmoth extracted a small amount to add to a prototype serum they'd been testing on Glaceon. But before they could test it, one of the observers al- alerted them to the Untouchables rioting in the streets. Ooh. And remember, Yogmoth is a capable fighter. That's right. So they all ran to look, but Yogmoth ordered them back to their stations, claiming the only way to truly fight back was to develop a cure. He also assured them that the city and the infirmary guards could handle the untouchables. That's when Yogmoth got a sinister idea, one of many. Instead of testing his serum on Glacian, he planned to use it on one of the diseased untouchables in the street. So he took four observers to the barred infirmary door, infirm, infirmary, to the barred infirmary door, <laughs> I'm not... Infirmary. <laughs> Infirmary. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> they were all armed with swords, and Yogmoth ordered them to unbar the door, telling them not to bar it until he returned. The streets were a gory chaos, and it wasn't long before Yogmoth caught the attention of an untouchable. He charged Yogmoth, hur- hurling a spiked board at his head. Yogmoth casually batted it away. He noticed the lack of lesions beneath the man's torn clothes and took off his head with a quick swipe. As the man's body slumped to the ground, Yogmoth said, Not a good candidate. God, he's cool. <laughs> he continued to look for a he yeah. continued to look for a better one and spotted a scrawny man covered with lesions up the street. It's an upward incursion. That's right. He walked through the stream of untouchables, killing any who attacked him. And when he got to the scrawny man, he wrapped one arm around his neck and picked him up off the ground, being careful not to break his neck or crush his windpipe. Pays to be taller than most halcytes. I was going to say, sounds like a short king. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yogmoth carved a path back to the infirmary door and pushed it open. The, observer, the observers barring it behind him. They ascended back to the infirmary, and when they arrived, Yogmoth threw his prisoner onto the table and ordered the observers to hold his limbs down. Yogmoth then ordered two bladders of the serum be decanted, one for the prisoner and one for the genius. Once he knew it worked, he would give it to Glacian. Once the task was complete, an observer handed Yogmoth one of the needle, needle-tipped bladders as he injected it into the prisoner's neck and he injected it into the prisoner's neck. At first, the man convulsed, then relaxed, and they all witnessed the lesions on the man's body dissipate. The observers thought it a cure, but Yogmoth observed that it merely created a resistance to the effect of thysis. The metal particles in the serum did indeed block the magical energies created by power stones, but for how long, he couldn't say. And kind of like vaccines, hey? Hey, hey, also, this is kind of topical, but, uh, well... Well, we can we can chat about the we can chat about this later. Never mind. We want these to be evergreen. So, with their attention <laughs> still on the patient, the small man tried to get up, but Zod and his colleagues continued to hold him down. So he asked, "Where am I? What are you doing?" "You're in the Halcyon Infirmary, and what I am doing is healing you." "Healing me? 
Why would you heal me? Yagmoth signaled to the observer who brought him the first bladder to bring him one filled with poison. <gasps> and he took it from her. Uh-oh. He took it good. Healing you was just an incidental occurrence of the riots. It wasn't anything personal. Just like the rape and murder you perpetrated. Not, or, yeah, perpetrated. Yeah, he's getting raped. Just like... <laughs> get raped with it. No, 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 no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just like the rape and murder you perpetrated. Nothing personal. Just an incidental occurrence. Well, I'm glad you think so. And now, for your crimes, I revoke the life I gave you. With none of his previous gentility... Yogmoth sank the needle into the man's neck and squeezed. The man began to convulse again while the observers made sure he didn't fall off the table. Then, he was dead. All the observers backed away except for Zod, who felt a mixture of determination and terror at the tasks ahead. Yeah, Zod's going to be like his right-hand boy. Boy! Uh, boy! After that, under right-hand island boy. After that, they used the serum on Glacian. His lesions did improve, but nowhere near to the, to the degree of the untouchable Yogmoth killed. Then he suggested it was likely because Glacian had been suffering from the disease far longer. I wonder, too, if it, like, depends on how you got it. Like, if you got it directly from Power Stones or if you caught it. Yeah, because he says it's spread by physical touch, but then you get it from... Um, like the the origin of the disease is from power stone radiation so yeah so and it's he like works... you have to have a certain amount of power stone radiation in your body already to actually catch it yeah and like he's you know worked around power stones his entire adult life and i think glacian's like around 50 ish mm-hmm. like he's quite a bit older than yogmoth in the context of the story but i don't know exactly how old um he could be older i don't know i'm not even sure what the life expectancy is for these people because they're so they're supposed to be like super advanced. It's supposed to be a mixture between like Greek, um, like a Greek society and like a futuristic society. It's supposed hmm. to be kind of like a a mix between the two. Anyways, they still had a city wide. They still had a citywide riot on their hands. And after synthesizing a working serum for Thysis, Yogmoth had only one concern: Rebecca. Wink. Ooh. She was at the Thran Temple, floating over the city, when the riots began. One of her workers noticed the carnage in the streets. Um, and I may have forgotten to mention it, but in addition to the widespread murder, the Untouchables were also breaking windows and setting fires as they roamed, uh, meaning that the worker also noticed a city on fire. It's also important here to mention the geography surrounding Halcyon. Much like the Dominaria we're used to, the plane during this time period had only a few cities and settlements with nothing but uh, wild in between. Mm, Did they Uh, have Longest Road, though? mm, They (laughs) didn't, but they did. They were almost getting Harbor Master. Oh, excellent. (laughs) So in, in Halcyon's case... Uh, nothing but desert surrounded it, a desert called uh, Megadon Defile that stretched for, a thou- for thousands of kilometers. Uh, that meant that any sizable military threat would have to cross the defile to lay siege to Halcyon, which is a really cool name for a desert, by the way. I don't know, our desert's called that. Like Mojave? That's not as good. So because of that geographical obstacle, Halcyon had not faced an attack in over 200 years, which left the city's defenses somewhat bloated and dulled. The result was the ease with which the untouchables rolled over them. But getting back to Rebecca, uh, her and her crew watched as the untouchables approached the city center, which is where the temple was located. Uh, and as we mentioned, the temple floated over the city, but it was anchored from a, a point called the Pinnacle, which was because I guess it would just float away or something. They don't even they don't talk about that, but I assume it's like a helium balloon. Anyways, that was how Rebecca and her crew ascended to work on the temple each day, and it was also how the Untouchables would likely join them. Realizing this, Rebecca ordered her crew to find anything they could use as a weapon. Then they followed her to the entry point and waited for the damned. They would only be able to jump one or two at a time, and her plan was to push them off the temple ledge once they jumped across, but were still unbe- 
unbalanced. The ensuing fall would kill them as it was about a thousand feet up. When the Untouchables arrived at the pinnacle, led by Gix, they tried to jump across. The first one, a woman, made it and in her hesitation, Rebecca allowed her to kill one of her workers before she bludgeoned the Untouchable in the head. And after that, the diseased woman fell several hundred feet to the building below the floating temple. Rebecca and her crew were able to keep the Untouchables at bay for about five minutes, and in that time, they collectively killed ten men, eight women, and three boys. Rebecca being responsible for most of their deaths. She's probably going to have some PTSD from this. No, I would. That's when Gix arrived at the pinnacle. He made it across successfully and killed one of Rebecca's workers in the process. After that, Rebecca and her crew retreated into the temple, while more Untouchables followed their master. Gix planned to kill Rebecca a way to strike back at the two men he hated most. Anyway, it wasn't long before the Untouchables caught up, caught up and surrounded Rebecca and her crew. When they did, Rebecca pleaded with Gix, saying, Yagmoth is working on a cure. A cure not just for my husband, but for all people, including your people. Yagmoth can't find a cure. Even if he did, he wouldn't give it to us. Eh... <laughs> that's why you don't get to do parts honey <laughs> well he's sick he's like eh. <laughs> i would and i will and that's exactly so shortly after dousing glaceon with his new serum yogmoth and his observers followed the untouchables heading for the temple by cutting a path through the streets until yogmoth found a sedan chair poison swords Yagmoth found a sedan chair he and Zod commandeered. Then they zipped to the temple just in time to save Rebecca. Yagmoth went on as he floated in the sedan chair. I have a treatment, perhaps a cure. I have one dose here with me. Already Glacian's skin improves, his suffering eases. Why would you bring me a cure in the middle of a rebellion? I started. <laughs> Look, I'm trying to sell this oh, guy. You're good. You're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And it's straight into Yagamoth here? Yeah. Yeah. To end it. To ransom the life of this lady and the life of this city. I will give this treatment to you and will promise to descend to the caves and bring enough to treat everyone there in a week's time. If you stop this riot, if you and your people withdraw from the city. Gix wasn't convinced, but after Yogmoth injected himself with half the dose, with no ill effects, Gix accepted the other half as well as the deal Yogmoth offered. Then Gix gathered his people and descended back into the caves, reminding Yogmoth he had one week before they rose again for an upward incursion. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're going to pick back up for part two of the Thran. Cool. Okay, I have my theory. Yeah. Yogmoth wants to cure them because they're going to be like, yeah, Yogmoth. They'll be loyal to him. They, they'll be loyal. They'll be loyal. They're going to be loyal. They're going to be a bunch of Yahtzees. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I don't really want to give too much away about next week, but um, Yogmoth is going to gain more power, uh, both in the, in the, the health, Halcyon power structure and abroad. And... Uh, we're just going to find more about that uh, on the next episode. I don't know how many parts this is going to be. It's probably at least three. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, next week we'll we'll find out more about Yogmoth and the Thran. Cool. Do you have any predictions, Riley? Yeah. Any theories of what might happen? Oh, I, I think he's probably just going to cure them just so he has more fodder to work with later mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, think, I think that kind of lines up with what you're thinking. Yeah. I think he's also going to have a complicated romantic feelings for Rebecca. And it's maybe we'll see like him be like, but do I want to love a lady or do I want to be bad? <laughs> and, the, and then he has a little musical number. Yeah. 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 <laughs> where, he's, where he's conflicted. Yeah. Conflicted <laughs> between his work and his love. That's right. It's, t it's a tough. Uh... Ask the queen. It's, it's tough. tough. Oh, she knows. Yeah. 
I've yeah, been watching you're... The Crown. That's yeah. why. Yeah. So you know. <laughs> yeah. Basically the same story. Yeah. <laughs> what is this feeling? <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, thank you for listening, and uh, we will be back. Um, well, not next week, but we will be back to uh, continue this series. Uh, and until then, just uh, take it easy out there. And Ainsley, thank you for joining us again. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Yeah, don't don't play with uh, irradiated stones, people. Yeah, it's a good rule of thumb. Yeah. Generally speaking, yeah. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. See ya. Oh. She's sad. She's sad because... Like why you do this? Kevin bought different cat food. And... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. It was off brand. She did not like Uh-oh. it. She pretty much did not eat anything for like a couple days. And then he went and got the the good stuff again. But then like we get the big bags, so we fill up like a smaller like, container upstairs. Yeah. And he yeah. just put the new stuff on top of the stuff that she deems crap. <laughs> so when you get about two thirds into it, it starts to have the old <laughs> stuff in it again she and she's like, it. Fuck you guys, wow. I thought we were over this. Oh man, and my it's not, cats would would eat literally anything, and it's not which like, is a problem. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, funny. of course. And it's not like she'll eat like cat treats or food scraps. Like she will only eat this cat food. She has been a picky eater since the day, day we got her. Really? Like yeah. she won't wow. eat soft, like soft cat food. No. She won't eat like those temptation treats. Like Abra doesn't eat cat treats. Loves them. He yeah. it's like crack. We had to cut him off because yeah. it was too much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and like she won't eat anything. She won't eat chicken. She won't eat like tuna. Sometimes tuna, tuna juice. Wow, is, Sometimes. Yeah, but she's that is lo- so weird. Loves catnip though, and weed. Oh, she loves weed. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she's just a funny. She's 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 very um, highfalutin for a trash cat.